there's no such thing as a difficult boy, only a boy with difficulties. And every one of these has seen far more than his fair share of trouble. Every boy here has been orphaned or abandoned, each one rejected. They're delinquents or disturbed or the wretched children of prostitutes and criminals. Some don't know their parents and some wish they didn't. But today they all play and live and work together in a remarkable establishment. Who is the boy that lived in a big house with many servants? That the boy was told. Were the two boys happy? No, they weren't happy. Surprisingly, these boys are happy. Each arrived sullen, frightened, rebelling against a hundred hidden miseries. Each has found his place, his self-respect, in a community where suspicious youngsters learn the art of living together. Not an orphanage or an institution, but the main boys town of Italy, one of nine which since the war have taken in 20,000 resentful young vagrants and turned out as many secure young men. Today, two and a half thousand resident boys are growing towards the world, making up for a bad start in life which wasn't their fault. They're guided by the Irishman who, exactly 25 years ago, started it all. I see him as a sort of saint. Monsignor John Patrick Carroll Abbing, born in Dublin 57 years ago, brought up in Manchester, ordained for the Diocese of Salford, the Vatican priest with 20,000 children, the Pied Piper of Rome. Out of this, boys' towns were born. After the Germans surrendered, life wasn't suddenly freedom and plenty for the Italians. A miserable byproduct of the wreckage was the horde of hungry urchins, often without parents or homes, who lived on their wits, who stole or starved. The Scugnizzi, the boys of the shoeshine gangs, reached out to the young priest and they changed each other's lives. But I think it really started the first time that I actually was under bombardment, actually in a house that was bombed and, and collapsed. When I emerged, I saw this child sitting on the ruins of his home. And I think the very fact that, you know, realizing that three minutes before he'd had a home, he had a mother, and now his mother would be coming out to call him to go into, into lunch or to dinner. And uh, now this child's trying to realize that all this is dissolved, that he no longer has a home, he no longer has a mother, he no longer has a future, he no longer has a past. And I, uh, the first time probably, I said, what's a child feel like when he's alone, you see? And I realized then, I realize it more today, that the great tragedy of children uh, who ha don't have a family, whether this family is, mm, whether the father and mother are dead or whether he was abandoned, the great thing is this feeling of solitude, this feeling of, of just not counting for anything, being alone. And I thought, now, 2,000 years ago, a child was born, you know, to bring peace on earth to men of goodwill. And here, all over the world, men are killing each other. And the children who are the victims of this conflict are sleeping out in the open, sleeping out in the streets. Now, my first thought was, uh, was not uh, the thought of that I was going to, from then on, going to be dedicate my life to children. Uh, this wasn't feasible. I mean, I had my work in the Vatican, I had my job, but what I did think uh, was that uh, I would try and help these children uh, by feeding them. And then, of course, when you're feeding, eventually we're feeding about 180,000 children in the various cities with the help of all the little sisters uh, who would open their convents to have these children in at noon and again at night. But then again, you find that you're feeding them and you say, what happens now? They go off into the darkness. Where do they sleep? So the next effort is to try and put a roof over there. And you're still not realizing that this is all going to lead to the inevitable. That Someday you're going to say, well, you just can't look at 
after children in your spare time. It just can't be a, a marginal activity. And so from then on, that has been my life. Today, there are 160 boys in the Città dei Ragazzi, this show place outside Rome, supported mainly by American charity, by the Monsignor's expeditions with his begging bowl. To keep the nine boys' towns going, he must each year raise a quarter of a million pounds. It's not always simple for outsiders to feel at ease in an institution, but here there's nothing cold about charity. These boys work for their keep. When I started my first boys' town, the principle that they established was keen on the board and a manja, the boy who doesn't work, doesn't eat. And uh, this has followed us all the way through. And it's uh, this principle that very often pedagogists didn't agree with uh, because they said it put too much responsibility on a child at an early age. It's actually a principle that they... Uh, that they like very much because it gives them a sense of dignity. Instead of, of receiving all the time, as in the, uh, has happened in an orphanage for an institution, uh, the bread arrives on the tables by a miracle, you see, no visible effort. They're given their clothing, they've no choice about their clothing, they're just given it. And all through, they never really have a sense of being an individual who makes an effort, and this effort is crowned by success. Whereas uh, the very dress that the boys wear, especially on Sunday, uh, the things that they've bought because they like them, they, they, their taste, and they were able to buy them because they've been working, you see. And to me, this is the, gives, is the basis of a sense of dignity in a boy. Boys Town is a miniature capitalist society with its own currency, the Scudo, which has to be earned. And where there's money, there's a bank. Going to school is classified as work, which I suppose is fair. And the boys are paid 20 scudi a day just for learning. They pay out half that for board and lodging, and they have to buy their school books and soap and so on. If they want a Coke at the tuck shop, it costs half a day's pay. They can blue the earnings from a day at school on a packet of biscuits, or increase their income by doing a little honest labour. New boys are staggered when they're paid for doing what they were compelled to do in other homes, earning money to squander or squirrel away, and at the same time, earning self-respect. A short time ago, some of these boys with bank balances didn't even have names. A new boy is a guest for about 10 days. He has no obligations towards the community, but after 10 days, he becomes a citizen. In other words, the mayor speaks to him and asks him if he wants to accept this way of life. By then, he's seen the workings of the boy's town. Uh, I suppose the first thing that, uh, that strikes him at the surrounding is so different from an orphanage if he's been to one, so different from the street. Uh, the second thing are the relaxed surroundings. He sees that the, the youngsters seem to be happy. They seem to get along well together. And then someday he's going to get a shot because he's going to uh, see a boy going by with a, with a uh, Coca-Cola or something. And he's going to say, now, uh, where did you buy this? You say, I bought this in the store. Who gave you the money? Well, I earned the money, you see. And he's going to come up against the basic economic rule of the boys' towns, which is that they maintain themselves. They buy their own food, their own clothing, their own Cokes, everything, you see, they buy. These are new boys, are they? Yes, these are... Oh, yes, these are all new boys. Yes, some of the different sizes. This is the, the smallest of the group. Yeah? Yes, and these are one of the, one of the bigger ones. Because if, if they're 10, 11, 12, or 13, they come into this community. If they're over 13, they go into the uh, community industrial town. Yes, um, yes. Just, down the, just down the hill. Oh, okay. it's all right. It's all right. Yeah. right. There, there. Now, where have, the, where have these boys come from, for example? Some have been institutions before, little orphanages. Some yes. have just uh, recently had a death, have become orphanages and so on. Others have uh, just been hanging around, yes. waiting for some place like boys' town. Now, when he comes in, he has ten days as a guest. Yes. Do any of them decide they don't like it and they want to get back? I don't think so. You know, well, uh, obviously, there's uh, nostalgia, especially if they have any living relatives, you know. Yes. One, of our, one of the boys, his mother was in the hospital and uh, he knew that she was dying and therefore, of course, his first days here, I imagine, were real torture. Yeah. Because his mind was somewhere else and yes. being here was kind of 
you know, pointed up the fact that he was just going to lose his mother and so on. Mm. He yeah. actually has since he's been... But the, the one thing to remember about the youngsters is everyone's an individual. That's the first thing. Yes. And therefore you have to know the individual story, their, their past, everything in their past. The homeless post-war urchins have been followed by generations of rejected children and so-called hopeless delinquents. Today, a third of the citizens of boys' towns are illegitimate, and all of them have suffered a loss of identity and dignity and hope. One can appreciate the, the sudden drama of wartime, a, a child sitting upon its ruined home, having lost its parents a moment beforehand. But how does, this, uh, how does one transpose this kind of drama into the gentler tragedies of the 60s? Well, it's true that the child is no longer sitting on the ruins of his home, but children are still wandering the streets saying, nobody cares for me because they've been abandoned, because their parents are dead, and uh, this is a terrible realization that uh, people may say, oh, you know, nice little boy, give him a penny, but they really don't care for him. He knows, they don't mean anything. He could die tomorrow and uh, nobody would weep, you see. Nobody would feel the loss. So he, 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 gradually he has no esteem of himself. He says, I am nothing, I am nobody. And this is the thing that one has to eliminate, that one has to give to, to uh, the child the knowledge you are somebody, you see. You see, Boys Town, compared even to a place like this, which isn't all that bad, really, Boys Town seems like a sort of superior boarding school, doesn't it? I mean, a very desirable place indeed. Yes. Well, of course, Boys Town, first of all, you've got to realise it is, has to be home to a child. In other words, all his, all his memories in the future should be a place full of colour, not a luxurious place, but a place full of colour and light, a place of optimism, a place of hope, see. Uh, whereas for many children who grew up in institutions, their memories are simply of uh, white walls, white bedspreads, place antiseptically clean, you see, but nothing else. The child institution is at the mercy, you might say, of the adult. They hold power of life and death. They, have the, they hold food in their hands, clothing, privileges, uh, day out in the country, you see, going to the movies. And it's this that has been abolished in the boys' towns, because a boy has what he earns. I never give a, a, a youngster a Coke, but very often a youngster will stop and invite me to go in and have a, an ice cream in the, in the store, and he will pay for it, you see. Until a child is loved, until a child really feels that somebody cares for him, not because he has blue eyes and golden hair, but simply because he's a human being and there's something lovable in him, not because he's brilliant or intelligent. Uh, well, people say, how can you love uh, 100 children, 150 children? And I would say it's not at all difficult. Uh, some attractive children, uh, nice personalities, obviously uh, easier. But then you find some poor child, because of all his problems, because, of, <laughs> uh, because he's such a miserable little specimen, your heart goes right out to him. And you suddenly discover that you're f more fond of him than probably the other ones, you see. This is the therapy. Yeah, and they can, they can feel this. They, they can understand this. It's not a question of grade. You say, well, don't they resent? No, children are not possessive, really, in their love. They don't resent the fact that you care for all of them, as long as they know that you care for me, too, as an individual, you see. But not to do that, you've got to know that child. One thing I do prefer, and that is to have a boy right off the street than a child who's been in orphanages all his life. Because uh, the, the child who's lived in the normal regimented orphanage has learned, first of all, to be... Uh, well, he's learned to live with the system. So he, uh, he tells lies. He puts on a facade of, uh, of be behavior, you see. He conforms to the system. He knows uh, how to get along, you see. But inside, this isn't really what he's feeling. Uh, he also very often steals because to, in an in institution where every door was locked, to be able to get to, to get the better of the adult and go in and steal some food, it wasn't a, a matter of, of getting, actually getting food, he probably had enough to eat, but it was just feeling that he as an individual was cleverer, was clever, was more clever than the system, you see. Uh, whereas the boy off the street, 
he doesn't have any of these uh, this, these built-in complexes. He very often has all the vices, the life on the streets. What are they? Well, the uh, uh, bad language, extremely bad language, for, for sex, sex plays, and many other things, corrupted in many ways. But he is, uh, he is what he is. He's not pretending to be anything else. Allora, uh, verbale. Citizens aged from 10 to 17 administer their own lives by town government. Adults have no say so at all in the assembly, but each boy, however young, has a voice. Every two months they elect their mayor and judge by secret ballot. The mayor, a mature 16 or so, appoints his commissioners of sanitation, public works and finance. The juvenile judge administers justice. There aren't many failures, though every now and then they do catch a sharp kid with his hand in the till. In his first year he became their commissioner of labour. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, this kind of boy, you know, very bitter, very, you know, all the experience of the past, but ambitious, clever. And uh, he, uh, he did a good job as the, as the, uh, in cleaning the streets, so they made him commissioner of sanitation. And How old was he then? Oh, about 11. Mm. And the next mayor made him uh, commissioner of labor, you see, because he wanted to be mayor. This was his great ambition. Well, as commissioner of labor, he did an excellent job, the only thing was, the expenses of the department went up and up, you see. So uh, the, the Commission of Finance spoke to the mayor and said, you know, the expenses of that department are almost doubled. And the mayor said, well, is everything in order? He said, sure, absolutely, everything in order. All the receipts are there. In fact, it's never been kept so well, you see. The bookkeeping is just perfect. But then they found this boy had quite a large bank deposit. So they asked him about it, and of course it all came out, that he was giving... Uh, certain contracts and then getting a kickback, you see, 5% or 10%, I don't know, you see. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, uh, they, he was brought up for trial. Uh, now, these, you must imagine, these are all, all boys who've only been three, four, five, six months in the town. Their concepts of justice are very summary. So, uh, this, this little boy says, well, uh, I haven't stolen. If they, uh, I give these jobs perfectly in order, now if they wanted to give me, uh, out of the goodness of their heart, some, you know, uh, talk of appreciation, what's wrong with this, you see? And one could see that all the citizens, the young citizens, were saying, well, that's quite right, he's not stolen, you see. Uh, and the prosecuting attorney was nonplussed until he suddenly got an idea. And he said, uh, well, is it true or not that we had, a, uh, we had a, an increase in taxes a few weeks ago? And uh, yes. And then he turned round to the, to the public and said, you see, and maybe if he hadn't been giving all these exaggerated wages and getting all these uh, kickbacks, you see, we mightn't have had to increase our taxes. We're paying for all this. Well, the mood of the public changed immediately, you see. They were saying, now, hang him, shoot him, you see. So he was fined. He had to make restitution. And he couldn't hold public office for a, a year. And... Uh, Everybody learned from this, you see. Now, this is an instance of where a boy made a mistake, a very bad mistake, one might say, that he was, he was corruption, you see, in public office. This would horrify some educators. But natural fact, he learned his lesson, and all the boys learned the lesson, because they learned that uh, public office isn't a, 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 isn't a source of personal gain, it's an opportunity for service. See. It does seem, in this way, often, that boys' town is imitating life without being of it. Well, uh, it isn't imitating. It is a fact that all these things are in the boys brought in income tax. They brought in income tax, not because they said uh, in the outside world there's income tax, but simply because the, the, their administration had to find a way of paying public salaries. It's the same with health insurance. Now, no, uh, nobody said, you know, outside you get health insurance. The, qu the question arose, uh, when a boy is sick, he's not working, how does he pay for his meal? How do you pay for his expenses? And... Uh, the fact, of course, is that uh, he can't. So the first reaction in the community was, well, uh, we'll just give him free meals. Then one fine day when there was an epidemic of influenza and the, the manager of the restaurant protested because he said, I can't keep my account straight. I'm giving out 60 free meals a day, 90 free meals a day. I can't keep on like this, you see. So it was discussed in the assembly and they said, well, this is reasonable enough. Why don't we... Uh, 
work out some system whereby when a boy's working, he pays so much a week into a sick fund, and then if he's sick with the doctor's certificate, he'll be paid so much for his expenses and so on. So these companies come about naturally because they correspond to a real need of society. They are social needs, you see. It isn't imitating society, you see. But it's putting a youngster up against a basic fact of life, that in life there are no handouts. And also a basic moral fact in life, that uh, effort should be uh, rewarded, I mean, should have its success, you see. And these are basic truths. If you don't work, you don't eat. Mm. That's right. Self-government must be seen to be done. There can be no overhanging adult veto. So the boys discipline the hard cases through their savings. For misconduct, they're fine. But these are tough youngsters, so what about swift punishment for the bad boys? Could the Monsignor see his citizens beaten? No, of course not. No, no, no. They, uh, the trouble is, of course, then, that, one, that your adult counsellor says, well, how am I going to keep discipline if I can't find a boy? I'm not allowed to belt him over the ear, you see. <laughs> and, of course, this is wonderful that this problem does emerge because this is the old problem of authority and obedience you see, and they've brought face to face sometimes, have been in education for years, and they've suddenly brought face to face. How does one get a boy, for instance, in school, in the workshop, to obey one, if you've not, if you've no really means, repressive means, you see. And uh, so, for the first time in the life, you say, either you are an educator or you're not. If you are an educator, you know that it must be prestige. Not because you're a fascinating personality, but simply because uh, the boys will recognize in you somebody who's really honestly trying to do a job. My own experience is very consoling because some of the toughest boys, the ones that if I'd, that I might have moved on, you know, if we'd been thinking of making our job a little easier, have very often turned out to be the very best boys we've had, you see. And I'm not surprised because they are the, they're the tough boys. There's a very basic sincerity about them. Uh, all the bad things they do are right there on the surface. They don't hide them. Sometimes they flaunt them. It's a challenge, but uh, I found that if you, if, you, if you can just overcome that, sometimes it's extremely easy to deal with a tough boy. 20,000 old boys, many of them tough, have gone their ways into the world. They're yesterday's children. Behind them, a flourishing hometown founded on pity and love, where a young citizen gets to realize he may, just possibly, be a rather better person than he once believed. Spreading the idea, this mild Irish priest who goes quietly about his vocation and his great experiment. His unwanted boys, his reclaimed boys, know instinctively how much he achieves for some things are seen most clearly by eyes that have wept. I've kept for philosophy well, as a Roman philosopher said, you know, that to, to love children and not to give them respect as human beings, as individuals, is to treat them like a large household pet. Now, the greatest way to show respect for a child is to say, uh, for, for a young adolescent, is to say, uh, I believe that you can take it on the chin. I believe, you, I believe that you haven't got to be uh, pampered all the time. I believe that you can take things a little, when they're a little tough, you see. You can take responsibility. You can make decisions, you see. And uh, this, this is the greatest way of getting them to have confidence in themselves. So, of course, you can't say they've been a success when they've gone, because that means a material success normally. One assumes, one hopes, that they'll yes. all be that, successes this, as people. This is one of the things that I'm always being asked. What is your percentage of success? You yes, yes. And all I can say is, well, on about 20,000 boys, we've only had about five, six, seven, I don't, not more than that, who've had any trouble with the police, which is very negative, you see. But it may be an indication of something. Many of them have adopted a child you see, in addition to their own children, which I think shows that they, the, the, the feeling within them, you see, that they must keep on giving themselves. Uh, and I think in this case, that the sufferings they've known, sufferings are not productive of good if they're not assimilated, if we don't accept them, then we just become bitter. But if we're able to make them part of ourselves, part of the way of life, you see, 
then they become, uh, they give one greater understanding, greater sense of brotherhood, greater uh, willingness to serve. And I think that our, that our boys have this. And it's only through recognizing this, uh, this dignity that a man will be begin to believe in himself again. It's the only thing that will rehabilitate him. Uh, see, that people have faith in him. People say, I know you can do it. I know you can make good. And this is the great thing. This is the great therapy with young people. Believe in them. And you believe in them because you're realist, because you know that they can make good if they only uh, have the encouragement and the patience day by day. It's a long process. It's not a one-year process. It's a long process. But you know and I know that in the end, it will, everything will turn out well.